broadly on how the study of children uh, connects with policies that are made by various agencies, and in particular UN agencies, where she's working now at UNICEF, how they connect, and what can you do about that? She was reminding me over, over lunch also about a project that we were once trying to get up and running, which is a project um, that some of you um, will be able to relate to, because those of you who are in the IEDP program here at uh, GSC uh, know that we worked hard to establish relationships with UN agencies and nonprofits and so on, and many of you were going on internships. Um, but in the days before IEDP, there was a project that Pia and I and several other colleagues were trying to do, which would involve getting uh, students who had just completed or were completing their studies in developmental psychology to try to get them to apply what they had learned scientifically in the field with organizations like UNICEF and UNESCO and World Health Organization and so on. And just to say very quickly that that uh, failed, that project. And um, as we've sometimes said in, in, uh, here at Penn, a failure is not always a bad thing. It hurts, but you learn from that failure. You try to find, if you're persistent, or if one of our colleagues calls it grit here at Penn, if you have the grit or you have the willpower and maybe a little bit of luck, then you create another pathway. And in fact, IADP in some ways is a direct consequence of that, that earlier failure, but now I think a success internally here. So, um, uh, Pia Brito, um, actually her, she was a longtime academic at Yale University, um, and uh, I remember the days when UNICEF was trying to lure you away from academe, and eventually <laughs> succeeded. Um, and I think, in many ways, uh, Pia Brito exemplifies the kind of thing that some of us here at IEDP and here at Penn are trying to do, and that is find ways of bridging between the knowledge that we have accumulated and the practice that needs to be put into play uh, in UN agencies. And so she's been involved over her years at UNICEF. How many years now? Uh, going to be three very soon. Yeah, it feels like 30, but it's only three years. <laughs> Uh, and uh, working all over the world on uh, the development of standards and practices in especially early childhood development. And her role there, I guess, is, is a senior advisor for early childhood? Yes, that's correct. Um, so, but she did have a life before that. Uh, and the life before that at Yale included, um, I think I'll just mention this, one um, topic that's really in the news almost every day which is the so socialization of children and youth from Muslim and, and Arab backgrounds. Uh, and she did that work here in the United States uh, post 9-11. Uh, and it's, we were just chatting about what does it mean to be studying that now as contrasted, let's say, with a half a dozen years ago or so. And has the science of that changed as a consequence of the politics and the political atmosphere that's out there? Um, we uh, had two projects together, one of which um, I actually have a, a, a little show and tell thing on uh, in my hand, this uh, really important book, The Handbook of Early Childhood Development Research and its Impact on Global Policy, which Pia was the senior editor on in the last days of her pre-UNICEF position when she had time to think and write. Uh, so if you don't have a copy of this, you can get this. Um, it is on Amazon, and it's a paperback, not too bad. And then we also had a chance to work together on a project that I didn't bring the book along on, but she had a key chapter on um, non-formal uh, education in a volume that I edited, which I think is Learning and Education in Developing Countries, that right. some of you have seen before. That's also on Amazon. Um, so. I could go on, of course, but I'm not allowed to. Um, Pia Brito is really one of the, the important lights in the UN system. Uh, and uh, with her sense of humor and uh, intelligence and oh, charm, and I could go on. Um, it's uh, just fantastic to have you with us. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us, and I can't wait to thank you. you have to say. Thanks, Dan. Welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Dan, so much. As you said, we've known each other uh, for a long while. 
and uh, one thing about Dan that stays very, very amongst the opportunity to collaborate and his immense scholarship and, and intellectual prowess, the one thing that stays very close to my heart is the first time I met him and he expressed his belief in what students can do and what they can do going forward. And to me that was one of those indelible moments when, when I realized that there are people who know the power of this collective here and how to harness that power. And it really was Dan was one of the people who taught me that. So I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to be back in the university. Thank you for the invitation I have to say sitting at the UN and doing this test. So it's really, really nice to be here with, with all of you. Um, I lost my microphone and they're not recording me anymore. Okay. <laughs> you. Um, and um, what I thought I would do today is just tell you a story. I tell you a story about the role of science in global policy. A story that if I was writing a, a cute novel, I would say, when biology met global government, or sort of, I would, I would think of a cute title like that. Um, but it's actually a very meaningful story, and it's a meaningful story that in some ways marks a change in history, that marks a shift in what is occurring now. And I think I bring you this story because where you sit now, you sit at that cusp of, of being in, in a center of knowledge and learning. And for you to realize that being in the center of knowledge and learning, you actually have immense power to make change. And in this story, I, I hope that you start to see where you are and where you fit in, and maybe what tools you need to acquire along your journey to make change happen. So I sort of want you to sit back and, and sort of listen, listen to this, this story, because I think that, that it's one that, that's pretty, um, that's one that really demonstrates that the worlds of, of knowledge and policy are actually not that disparate. There are ways to bring them together. So I'm going to start with um, a 30 second preface on what is early childhood development, just to make sure we're on the same page and because it was a reading given to you, so I feel I have to maintain some fidelity to your readings. But after that I'm going to go rogue and I'm not really going to be following the readings, but for that 30 seconds I'll do that. And then I, I want to tell you the story of creating the sustainable development agenda, the SDG goals that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And how was it that science influenced influence the sustainable development agenda, especially for early childhood. And then in this chapter of the story, I'm not going to end with a, the end or close. I'm actually going to end with now we are at the implementation cycle of the work. And for the implementation cycle of the work, what is required are your minds, your hands, your passion, and your commitment. Because if you pick up the storyline from here, you can start to write the next chapters. So what is early childhood development? And as I said, all of 30 seconds on this one. Um, it's this multifaceted concept that brings together the environment and the developing child through the first few years of life, more or less defined up to eight years of age, across a range of domains. But in, in addition to the child, it's also the environments, the environments of everyday caregiving, the environments of programs, the environments of policies. And so in this sort of biopsychosocial ecological model, we see the child embedded in these multi-layer contexts. It's, it's a period of life where we gain rapidly across several domains of functioning that make us who we are now. And it's a period of life where there is a huge amount going on in terms of service delivery. So I'm going to take... Um, there are two slides here I'm going to take a little bit of time on because these are two slides we're going to come to at the end. So these next two slides, somehow keep them in your mind. We're going to come to them at the end. If we look at the life cycle from birth to eight years of age, and we look at all the different sectors who are engaged. Here's education, here's social protection, here's child protection, here's health and nutrition. All these sectors who are engaged, we know each of them delivers a bunch of programs to support young child well-being, to support growth, to support learning, to support mental health, to support maternal health, 
to support poverty eradication. There's a bunch of programs that occurs. These programs are either supported by government, non-government, or private agencies. They can be for-profit or non-for-profit. They can be fee, they can be not for fee. And they either serve one generation that's only the adult, or they serve the other generation, only the child, or they serve two generations. So there's quite a rich tapestry when we talk about early childhood services, okay? We have to come back to this because of the complexity of what is implementation. And the second piece of what is this is when you go a higher level up to the policies or the enabling environment in a, in a country. So now I'm talking about national policies that really look at child development. They have to cover, again, a bunch of policies and sectors in order to be able to provide the coordination and sort of the, the governance that is required to be effective for delivery to occur. And I think that this is both the beauty of early childhood development but also in some ways the the challenge of it to bring coordination across sectors to make this happen so that i just wanted to give you that picture so we're all on the same page it's birth through eight years of age it's multifaceted development it's child in the environment the environment is both the proximal but also the distal and it ranges in a myriad of services and broader policies okay so now let's go to the story of creating the sustainable development agenda what is the generation that is passed is the Millennium Development Goals. The eight de Millennium Development Goals that at the turn of the century were developed to eradicate poverty and increase prosperity. And these eight goals really did achieve quite a few outcomes. And you guys, you all must be familiar with the MDGs, so I'm not going to go into the MDGs. But we know that they, they, made, they made progress in Ex uh, reducing extreme poverty, in improving child survival, in improving uh, the reduction of disease, in maternal mortality, uh, decreases in maternal mortality, and one of the big education achievements was the number of children who were in primary school. Whether they are learning or not, we put it for a side, but the goal was to get kids into school, and they were in school. So there, were, there was a number of achievements. But in the MDGs, there was no mention of early childhood development. No, zero, nada, zilch, nothing. Not even in there, not even in the text. So for that 15 years, there was no mention. Yet, the science of early childhood was growing. Right? There were the amazing amount of research that was coming out saying, this matters, pay attention, this matters. We knew the early years are important. There was tremendous growth in measurement, population-based measurement of measuring development outcomes for young children. So there was a lot of growth occurring, but it wasn't in the development framework. The other point to pay attention to was when the MDGs were being developed, the infant mortality rates were about 30%. We were losing vast number of babies in the first five years of life. And the MDGs really did a targeted set of work on improving child survival. And at the end of the MDG era, we saw a huge change. We saw a huge reduction globally in infant mortality. But while this huge change was occurring in infant mortality, we were noticing another change. Children were surviving but not thriving. We were noticing another change occurring. There was an increase in the number of children who were not achieving to their potential at age three, at age four, at age five. So the question for the SDGs shifted a little bit. It shifted a little bit from child survival to child thrival. It shifted a little bit to say that our focus on just getting um, children to pass their first month and their second month and the third month is insufficient. We need to focus on their developing capacities. We need to focus on their ability to be truly functioning citizens of the 21st century. And so within, with that backdrop of what the MDGs had achieved, of the situation of science and knowledge 
and of the situation of children, what were the processes that started for the Sustainable Development Goals? So I'm going to go a little bit into sort of some UN speak and a little bit of the process speak. But I think this will be helpful for you to see how in a very large process that has multiple aspects and dimensions, how do you fit in your area that you are most passionate about? How do you find the entry point to bring in your issue into this big, wide landscape of what is going on. So the, sustain the sustainable development uh, process started more or less in 2012 with the first sort of articulations laying out a framework. A framework around four pillars. Environmental sustainability, peace and security, inclusive social development, and inclusive economic development. And these are the four pillars around which then the themes and the discussions started to occur. There were three principles underlying all of this work, human rights, equality, and sustainability. In the core, of the core of these three principles and these four thematic areas, for each one of them, we, they, the system started to list out exactly what were the levers of change that were going to help us achieve the agenda we wanted. So this was the original framework that was laid out in 2012 that started to guide the process that took three years. The formal inception of the process took place with a high level panel authorized or sort of put forward by the Secretary General that had three co-chairs and 27 eminent people. These were the first thinkers or the visionaries who were asked, who were tasked with putting forth an agenda for the world we want. Putting forth an agenda for what would it mean for the next 15 years for us to say we have made a difference. These were the first people who were asked to articulate that. And this is how the process started for the Sustainable Development Agenda. There were four work streams that guided the Sustainable Development Goals. The first was this high-level panel that I talked about, the eminent people. And they held different consultations in their countries. They held consultations with other networks. This was sort of the, the panel that, that the Secretary General said, I want to know your thinking. I want to know from you what should we do in the world. But that wasn't the only sex work stream. Then there was a work stream where the private sector came forward. Because the private sector said, you know, during the MDG era, we didn't really have a key role to play. It was primarily UN and government led. But we are a key voice in inclusive economic development. We are a key voice in inclusive social development. Sustainability matters to us. We contribute to it. So the private sector created their own compact and their own process to create their vision for Agenda 2030. Then the civil society organizations said, this process is being too heavily led by UN. Civil society needs to have a voice, which is right, because civil society is a very key player in development. So the Sustainable Development Solutions Network was formed under the leadership of Jeffrey Sachs to develop their vision for 2030. What are the goals they would put forward? How would they say that the world should look like in 30 years? And then finally, member states and countries said, in all of this, governments are getting left behind. Where is the voice for governments to speak? These, these are our countries. These are our people. We need to have a voice in this agenda. This can't be an agenda like the MDGs where people went into a room and they decided now, hey, you, rest of the world, these are the goals you're going to have to achieve. They said, no, these, this is our development. We don't want to be held accountable for benchmarks and targets that don't make sense to us. So the open working group process started with member states leading the discussion. So you can imagine four huge processes, parallel work streams took off to try to create the agenda for the world we want, okay? That's now an immense, immense, immense set of work, yeah? And it is amazing that in the end, the work streams came together to articulate 17 goals and 169 targets. So this is the current architecture of the Sustainable Development Agenda. And I think, are you somewhat familiar with it? Yes. 
So this is the current architecture and it's pretty phenomenal that all those work streams started to coalesce and come together. Across all of this, poverty, hunger, health, industry, sustainable cities, peace, justice, where is early childhood development? How do you fit in something like this into this massive, massive big agenda and processes that we're developing? So we had to figure out how do we get the winning argument? How do we get policymakers and global leaders? How do we infiltrate these four work streams that are very, very different sets of people in these four work streams to adopt and understand this message? to pay attention to what science is saying. So we started to look at, at neuroscience. And the first thing we did was we convened a group of eminent scientists at UNICEF. We brought them together and we said, what really is the science saying about early childhood and why it matters? Why should global government pay attention to this? And this was one of the first steps in trying to articulate very clearly the message we wanted policymakers to hear. Then we started to take those messages and distill them in a manner that it made sense for the sustainable development agenda. We started to draw on the fascination. We started to draw on the credibility. We started to draw on the exciting new world of neuroscience. Because remember, children were surviving, but they were not thriving. Remember that while the Millennium Development Goals were going on, there was no mention of this new knowledge. So we had to bring to the forefront this exciting new science that said, really, brain development, getting it right, is the foundation of lifelong learning. Now, you may not agree with this argument, and that's fine. Because there are many arguments. The arguments put forth were on return of investment. Right? We've read so much in the literature on early childhood that investments in early childhood programs give you a return in adulthood to the individuals, to societies. Internal efficiencies are gains in the education system. You may pick those arguments. There are so many different arguments that could be picked. The artistry in bringing evidence to policy is in knowing which arguments are going to stick. In knowing which arguments are going to capture the imagination of the decision makers. And in trying these different arguments out, we found the neuroscience argument was starting to stick. It was starting to capture and make sense to leaders. They, was, they were intrigued by it. They were listening to it. So we started to use that science and be very, very clear in linking it to the sustainable development agenda. The first was to make it clear that environment matters. It's not just the genes. Why are we saying environment matters? Because the sustainable development agenda is about the environment. And what is the brain science telling us? Environment matters. We maintained fidelity to the science. We kept the accuracy of the science, but we positioned the message so that it would reach a non-scientific audience and gave the power to the non-scientific audience to say, you do not have to be genetic engineers to make this happen. You have to do the work you are doing. You have to continue as ministers of finance to allocate budgets in the right places. You have to continue as a minister of education to allocate resources to pre-primary education because that is the environment that shapes the brain. Okay? So that's the first message we started to put forward. The second message we started to put forward was that timing matters. We don't have all life to do this. You know, this only happens at a certain period in life. This doesn't happen at any time. So that sense of when should we invest to get the biggest returns. And we started showing, this is data um, that has been uh, by Chuck Nelson and colleagues. You may have read about the Budapest um, studies where they look at children who were institutionalized, those who were placed in care after two years of age, those who were placed in care, you know, a caring environment before two years of age, and those who were never in institutional care. 
And this research is showing the sooner the children were taken out of a, of a sterile, neglectful environment, the sooner they had a catch up to peers who never ever experienced that sort of degree of adversity. And we see this, so this is done with sort of the brain functioning images, and this is done later when they were measuring their developmental quotient. And we see the same thing. The sooner children are taken out of the environment that is harmful for them, the better the recovery. So timing matters. The later you wait, the longer. So, so presenting arguments to say the urgency to act is when, and the urgency to act is how. So we took the science and started to present these messages. And then we did a bit of playing around with trying to then present this very, very credible body of work so it speaks to all the different stakeholders who are engaged in this. Because if you remember the earlier slides I showed you is early childhood doesn't fit into one sector. It's nutrition, it's health, it's protection. And we started to create messages that said, nutrition feeds the brain, stimulation sparks the neurons, protection provides safety from toxic stress, because the increasing number of children who are living in conditions of conflict, 87 million children under the age of seven have experienced chronic conflict. We started to present this data in a way that, that the non-scientific audience understood it. Then the next thing we did was we found the platforms to deliver the message. Okay, so first was we made the case that kids are surviving but not thriving. Then we took the science and digested it to make sense to the broader 17 goal agenda. And then we started to find the right advocacy stat statements and platforms to start to create the buzz around it. And as you think through your own work and where you want to be and where you want to go with the area you're looking at, be it inclusive education, be it looking at ethnic minority children, be it looking at, uh, at making policy change in budgets, teacher trainings, where is it that you want to make the change and what is the key message that you are going to be able to take forth from the learning that you have acquired here that you know is credible, strong learning? And then what are the the advocacy ways you're going to take this forward. So then we started to look through all the different advocacy platforms and each of these were linked to those four processes. The Sustainable Solutions Network, the Private Sector Compact, the Open Working Group, and the High Level Panel. So we started to target those four work streams. <coughs> we started to target them through very, very clear advocacy ways. See, you see this open working group. We had a whole session on, on early childhood. So we started to, to target this. And then we started to champion, we started to get champion messengers. Here you have a picture of Michelle Bachelet. Um, we, had we had big celebrities, we had Shakira, we had, because the way celebrities carry a message, nobody else does. We started to champion this. And then finally, we get our message in. The Secretary General on the eve of launching the development goals makes one statement. The sustainable development goals recognize that early childhood development can drive the transformative hope we, the transformation we hope to achieve over the next 15 years. Through this process of the science, understanding how to use it, we were able to take it to the highest level of authority on this process, which was the Secretary General. And for the eve of the launch of the summit where people are talking about disarmament, climate change, health, finance, the topic he chose to talk about was on early childhood development. Drawing on the science messages. So this is a very, very powerful story that tells you knowledge and evidence matters. And knowledge and evidence can influence policy and practice. It is a process. It is not immediate. And it's not a linear path either. You have to, in that process, think through what tools and mechanisms you have to make that happen. So now we come, but this is where the story doesn't end, right? Now, you've got in, now we've got into the goals. What does that mean? Just making it there doesn't mean that now you can sit back and say we're in the goals. We got into the goals, why? 
We got in the goals because we believe that every child should have the right and fair chance to life from the very start. That's why we got into the goals. So now the work begins in making sure the goals work to achieve that agenda. So these goals are meant to work together. They are not like the MDGs where there were eight silos. They are supposed to cluster together. So now the work begins on how do you start to cluster them together. Okay. Again, we go back to the science for that. Again, we go back to the evidence for that. Again, we go back to the knowledge for that. For the goals, we start to establish why early childhood development is the foundation. Why is it that it has a multiplier effect across these goals? Why is it that investing in one area can give you a clustering across several areas? So then we start to do this analysis, a very rigorous analysis, for what each goal hopes to achieve and where does early childhood fit in and you would do the same thing you maybe are joining an agency where the strategy of the agency is very disparate from where you are and you feel you know no one's paying attention to my area I'm so sort of feeling marginalized and on the side how do I get into the main narrative of my organization how do I get into the main work that my organization is doing and you start with this process of analysis and you go to the evidence you always go to the evidence and if there's one thing I've learned in being in the UN system if you speak on behalf of the evidence you're always on a sure foundation because that solid. So we started this process of analyzing. So we started by, again, for eradication of poverty, what is it that we know from, from early childhood development? For nutrition, uh, I know one of your colleagues is going to Jamaica. From Jamaica, we have the research that shows when you combine stimulation with nutrition, you actually get much better results than just nutrition alone. We looked at health. We know that early childhood interventions, this is a plethora of science on this, set your good health, lower cardiovascular and non-communicable disease. These are the big issues the health goal is targeting. We are early childhood is in goal number four around learning. So we already had that in there, but we started to weave in the economic data. We were able to bring in the exact measurements for target 4.2, which is the target on early childhood development. Which, by the way, I have to tell you the story about how we got these three. How much time do I have? You're doing okay. I'm doing okay. Tell the story. Okay, I'll tell you guys the story. It's a good story. So, um, so as you can imagine, oh, I'm being recorded, right? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> so maybe I'm not going to tell the story. <laughs> um, okay. It was a. We did a lot of advocacy to get these three words to hang together. And I will say no more because I don't want to go on record for this. Um, but we, we really worked hard to get these three words to hang together because we, the moment they got separated, we would lose this area of work. And we didn't want to lose this word quality. So in the end, we, once we started making inroads, the next battle was around language and having the right people, knowing the people who were sitting at the table. I don't know if any, um, Dan and I were at a forum in Korea last year where it was the Education World Forum meeting and the declaration for education was being written up. And going into the forum, the declaration around early childhood had sort of a very um, minimalist sentence like kids should have one year of pre-primary or I don't even think it was a complicated sentence. It was such a simple little sentence in there. And that was quite, that really didn't cut it, right? So the whole forum in Korea, we were working through the different country delegations who had come, who were at the table, who held the pen. We had sessions, we had side sessions. We had Jim Heckman, the Nobel Prize economist there. We had heads of, of different agencies, ministers talking. So when we came out of the World Economic uh, Education Forum, with the declaration, we had the full paragraph we wanted that had these three words strung together, not being broken with quality, and a full justification for it. 
So, so we worked hard to keep that in there because ultimately those are the pegs and anchors you need to push your agenda forward. And now the last battle we just won. So the first indicator was participation in organized learning. So when this target went forward, this was the first indicator put forth. Okay, what does enrollment rates do? What is the state of learning right now? This, adding this indicator is not going to amount to a hill of beans. Really, that's what we felt. So we pushed hard to get this indicator in where we were able to measure development outcomes, where we were able to measure how children are doing on health, learning, and psychosocial well-being. There are two interesting pieces to this. When the IAEG, the, the, when the Statistical Commission got together, the Interagency Statistical Commission got together in Bangkok last October, they were voting on these goals and on these indicators. And we went into the meeting with zero votes for this. All the votes were for this, because this is easier to measure, right? I don't blame governments. They have 169 indicators. I mean, are they going to do the implementation of the programs or just monitoring of the indicators? You know, governments will select the easier indicators because they've got programming to do. So this is a much harder indicator to track. So we go into the negotiations in Bangkok with zero votes on this one and all the votes on this one. And some really powerful countries are speaking on behalf of this one. I'm not going to take any names. And the <laughs> negotiations start up and you have to present again the science, again the measurement, again the robust data, again the ability to measure the credibility of these measures at a population level Again, you go back to the evidence. Again, you go back to the knowledge. And we were able to push, and by the end of the voting period, nearly all 23 member states voted. And the indicator got in and was just approved in March 8th. Again, we had that process. And I haven't gone into every advocacy process we did, but how it was as evidence and science-based process that took us there. The other thing we did, which really worked for us, was this was an education goal, but we snuck in the words health, learning, and psychosocial well-being, because early childhood development is holistic. And if we had just stayed with learning, the other areas wouldn't feel the same degree of affinity to this indicator that we want them to adopt. I wish we were not on camera because I would love to tell you some background stories, but another time. <laughs> then we again went back to the data on, on gender equality that talked about the nexus between early childhood and women's economic empowerment. Again, we went back to the science on that. We went back to the decent work agenda that talked about uh, the importance of childcare being part of the decent work agenda. We worked closely with ILO on this one. We talked about how investments in professionalization of the early childhood workforce is particularly important for women. Goal 10, again, use the science to reduce inequity. We basically made the case, if we are going to start baking inequity in babies' brains, how can we ever have equality? If from the very start there is no equality in opportunity, how are we going to get equality of outcomes? And that's really how we started to again use the science to speak to every goal. We started to talk about biophilic features and biophilia in terms of creating sustainable cities. And I was talking to Dan a little bit about this, how data was coming from countries like Fiji, some of the island nations, where there is really this love for flora and fauna as part of empathy that helps you engage with nature. We started to talk about how uh, the neurobiology of early development is linked with reduction of violence and promotion of peace. How in our neurobiology we have these neuropeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin, how they act in times of conflict, how they act and how they can be improved through early childhood interventions, attachment, bonding. For each one of these we were able to use the science to start to make the connections. And finally, we have the indicator that I said that measures early childhood development as a core indicator that can help to strengthen the means of implementation. So right now we are in, in a historic moment for early childhood. 
We're in a very historic moment because we are recognized as part of the development agenda and the science has come of age. And we were able to use this and leverage the science to be able to get into speaking to these multiple goals in a way that the ad agenda gets adopted. So now we come to the third chapter. Now we're in the agenda, we're in the architecture. How are we going to make difference happen? How are we actually going to talk about implementation in countries? Because that's now where the rubber hits the road. That is really where change has to occur. We have to see a significant increase. If I come back here two years from now or three years from now, and nothing has changed in the percentage of children who are on track in health, learning, and well-being, that's not going to be a good sign. Because ultimately, we want that indicator to change. We want to start hitting time-bound targets in a clear way. We want to have milestones that make a difference. So in implementing the agenda, we are coming together in a broad alliance of co-led by UNICEF and the World Bank by Mr. Anthony Lake and Dr. Jim Kim to bring together key governments, partners, foundations, civil society, academia in a global alliance to say, if we want to make this change, what are the core actions we need to take going forward at a country level? And what is our common result that we're going to work towards? And so five actions have been identified in this growing alliance. The first is to implement key interventions at the right time in an integrated manner. The second is to focus on the capacity of the workforce to deliver the services. The third is to establish the data and evidence platforms that are going to help us track change, that are going to build capacity to be able to read data and use it for informing improvement in programming, to ensure sustainable finance. Early childhood is miserably funded. It gets a point some percentage of an education budget, if that. And to advocate to build a movement. Because when there is demand and there's a movement, when supply meets demand, that's when you really see change. And early childhood is a natural demand area because there is no other issue in the world that parents care about more than their children. You actually don't need to do anything. The demand is there, it just needs to be harnessed. So each of these five actions now start to get spelled out. I'm not going to go into each of the five, I'm just going to focus on the first one to tell you again how we are using science to spell out the action. How we are developing these intervention packages. So to develop these intervention packages, we started with a very, very detailed systematic review methodology that many, many, that many of you are really familiar with. And we looked at both reviews of reviews and we looked at evidence-based interventions across a range of maternal, newborn, child health, nutrition, education and protection interventions. We swept the literature. As you can see, we went to every um, source uh, to capture what is out there with respect to the effective interventions that have been proven to make a change in child health, growth, learning, and development. And we followed whatever the systematic procedures are, the state of the art, on doing these reviews. So we did a very, very, very extensive review. I'm sure this is a methodology you're used to. This is a methodology you're familiar with. So again, you have the tools, you have the skill set you need to start to make something happen. This is not a methodology that's out there. This is a methodology you probably all have used for your thesis in some way or the other. This is a methodology you're all really familiar with. We took that methodology and we started to map interventions. How did we do that? We took the life course from adolescent health to children five years of age. Across the life course, for each sector, health, nutrition, we started to map the intervention that had come up from the literature as being effective, primarily in low and middle income countries, 
for children's outcomes, okay? So that was the first step in the process. And I always tell everyone, in creating these programmatic interventions, I feel like we are creating the iPhone, which ultimately is the one touch, but you open the iPhone, and it's a very, very complex system of chips that is in there that then goes to your one touch. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create these one-touch packages, but when you open that up, you see this labyrinth of detailed interventions. I want you to go back to the third slide I showed you where I said so many sectors are engaged in early childhood across the life course. They all need to be engaged in developing these comprehensive packages. So we took that conceptual model and we started to map it out with all these detailed interventions. And we mapped it across sectors of education, child protection, HIV, social protection, water and sanitation, all the key areas that touch the lives of young children and families through some service delivery mechanism. Okay? Then we come to how do you combine these interventions in a meaningful manner? Right? Because no, one, no country is going to invest in all of these for early childhood. It's not happening. This is not something every country is going to do. So we need to create these combinations, these packages of interventions that make sense. So we started this process of creating packages, and we started this process in Latin America first. Because in Latin America, the biggest epidemic is violence. It is the biggest epidemic facing the population of children and families. Violence experienced in its many, many, many forms. So how do we start to change that with these packages of interventions? Because remember, we want every young child to have the right start to life, to be thriving, and to do well in learning and well-being, right? So we, we went to the child protection sector who has identified the issue and said, this is where violence is occurring, these are the situations, this is the prevalence. But this sector didn't have in its toolkit any interventions. The only interventions it has are birth registration and some high level policy work. So then we went to early childhood because they have the interventions, the positive parenting programs that have proven to be effective in reducing violence and promoting positive behaviors. So now the child protection section has to start to come together with the early childhood because the interventions lie here. But neither of these have systems to deliver services. It's actually health who reaches families with very young children. So then you have to rely on the health to deliver the system, to deliver the effective package to reduce the harsh discipline. We also have another delivery system in Latin America that's social protection through the cash transfer programs. That also reaches vulnerable families. So you do cash transfer plus the positive parenting package together to prevent and reduce violence. So this is now how we are starting to package these interventions in a meaningful way so they resonate with the region and context we're in. So the process of, of the first arm that I showed you was, we first mapped all the interventions, then we started to package them together in this meaningful manner like we're doing for Latin America, and then you identify the delivery platforms. Is it community? Is it media? Is it school? What is the delivery platform where this package can be effectively delivered? Each of these stages relies on the knowledge and the science, on evaluation, on the literature to know how are we going to take the next step forward. So in this big alliance that we have with the World Bank and with other WHO, UNESCO, with some of the leading foundations in the world, member states, academic partners, how are we going to bring this in? This is one of the core actions we're talking about. So some of the main conclusions just from that is, if we take a life course approach, we can start to identify these effective interventions. It's science that's really offering us the insights to move into the implementation and the packaging. And what we have started to identify is nurturing care and protection. That element when added to these packages of services is one of the active ingredients that leads to change for young children and families. We know that every dose and every medicine we take has an active ingredient. 
through the literature we're finding the active ingredient of nurturing care and protection is the one that's really starting to make the difference. So I'm going to close in the words of my executive director, Mr. Anthony Lake, who says what we are learning now should ignite a revolution in how we think about and act on early childhood development. There are three revolutions that are going on in this world. There's one on climate change and environmental sciences. There's one through technology, that's part of our life. And the third is through the brain science. And the third one through the brain science is what we have in our hands to make a difference. And I think, and I want to say, based on what each one of you is doing and studying here, you have in your hands that power to act differently and to think differently, because change is possible. I went from an academic institution to this big institution called the United Nations. And in that, through the power of knowledge and science, was able to move an agenda. And that power and that knowledge lies in, in each one of you. And that's something that you should take forward. Because if you do that, I know that all these goals and targets we're talking about are going to change. And you will be able to say that when you started your journey, what was the situation? And as you shifted the goalpost, what happened? How did the game change? And the knowledge and evidence you have learned here is what's going to take you forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was on time. Perfect. Okay.